This week on The Laura Flanders Show, the struggle for black economic independence. In 1969, Shirley Sherrod co-founded a collective farm in southwest Georgia. At 6,000 acres, it was the largest tract of black-owned land in the United States. What happened to it? You'll find out. But the ideas behind it just might be worth revisiting. All that and a few words from me on America's greatness at making poor Americans feel not great. Welcome to The Laura Flanders Show, where the people who say it can't be done Done, take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Not a lot of people have had a chance to design a new community, a community that would be different and equal, co-owned by its residents. But our next guest was part of a process just like that in the late 1960s in southwest Georgia. What happened to the new community's land trust that they planned at that point? You'll hear. But let's just say they were way, way ahead of their time. Perhaps their time is coming back. Shirley Sherrod is a longtime civil rights organizer and trainer. You may remember the scandal when right-wing propagandist Andrew Breitbart doctored a tape of her and got her fired from her appointed post as Georgia's State Director of Rural Development for the United States Department of Agriculture. Well, she won a settlement there, and she's never stopped fighting. Today, she sits on the executive committee of the Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative for Economic and Social Justice. It's a collective of women leaders in the South. She also works with the Southwest Georgia Organizing Project and the New Communities Land Trust continues. I am very pleased to welcome her to our program. Shirley, welcome. Thank you. Oh, well, let's get right <laughs> into it. You said, I've seen you say it many times, you never intended to live in the South or work on a farm. What That's happened? so true because I, I grew up on a farm, had to do that backbreaking work, so I wanted to get away from that, but I also wanted to get away from the conditions we lived in uh, in the segregated South, so especially in Baker. So describe a little bit what your family history had been there in Baker County, southwest yes. Georgia. Yes. Well, growing up on the farm, we owned our land, so it was different from those who lived on farms owned by plantation owners or, or other white people. Um, but the difficulty came in that we had a sheriff who ruled everyone and everything. Um, he had the county locked down, so to speak, so much that you couldn't even ride through Baker County without being stopped. If, you, if he was drunk, many other things could happen to you. So he collected money on the road. Oftentimes when we had family coming to visit from the north, for example, we would meet them at the county line. Mm. Sheriff Gator Johnson, right? That's right. That's right. How did your family get land in the first place? You know, that's interesting because, um, and I've done a lot of research on it to try to figure out just what happened. I don't know where they were as slaves, but I did find them in the 1870 census in Baker County. Mm -hmm. They started out as sharecroppers, and their goal was to share crop and help each family member get land. So when I say each family member's member, it's my grandmother's father's uh, siblings as well as his siblings. So they were able to work, help each other, and where I grew up was called Hawkinstown because they had bought probably together 5,000 acres of land. Mm. And what did working together enable them to do that if they'd been trying to make it on their own would have been so difficult? Well, each, uh, you know, helping my, my uncles would always tell this story that my grandfather from my mother's side of the family was like the judge in the family. So if there was a dispute, if he solved it, everybody would abide by it. He would also say, you know, if one family member finished their work on their farm and they decided they were going fishing or whatever, you know, to have fun, um, he'd be out on the road saying, where are you going? And he said, nope, we, and everyone would have to go and help each other. It was, it was a, you know, they had a tight bond mm -hmm. during those years and, and it really, that's what I grew up with, working and, and being proud of the fact that we were acquiring um, land and assets, but I didn't want that life. Mm. So it 51 was, years ago, I think, this spring, yes. you were set on leaving and something happened. Yes, um, I was a senior in high school, actually not even applying to schools in the South, 
because I thought back in those days you'd probably meet your husband on the college campus. So I didn't I want a chance even marrying someone from the South. Um, and I was secretly planning all of this. My father didn't realize I wasn't sending out <laughs> applications to any schools in the South. But um, on, the, on the morning of March the 15th, 1965, I was called to the principal's office to um, be told that my father had been shot. And um, my four other siblings, all girls, were there in school at different levels of school, and they called them next. Um, my father survived 10 days, but died on March the 25th. And um, on the night of March the 25th, my mother was, she was seven months pregnant at that time. My father had convinced my mother to try just one more time for this boy. And he was so happy. As soon as the doctor uh, confirmed the present, or the pregnancy, rather, he um, was telling everyone, this is the boy this time. Was it? Uh, it was. Um, he didn't live to see him because he was born two months after my father's death. But when, when my father died, the house filled with people that night uh, coming to try to comfort us. And I went into one of the rooms. We had just moved into a new home that my father had built. And um, I started praying and asking for, I, I felt I needed to do something. I was the oldest. Mm -hmm. And many thoughts came to my mind. I should go try to find this man and try to kill him. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't, when my father tried to train us to fire a weapon, I'm the oldest and all of my young sisters were taking the gun and just shooting. And I, when he put it in my hand, all I could do was cry, you know. so. I'm just praying and asking, and finally the thought came to my, to my mind, you can give up your dream of going, living in the North and devote your life, to stay mm -hmm. here in the South mm -hmm. and devote your life to working for change. Now, I didn't know what I would do or how I would do it, but I made that commitment that night. Now, your, your father's killer was never prosecuted. Never. Um, what you came to learn after the event was that it did have to do with a dispute over a cow, right? Yeah. We, he, had, he had cows, um, and I don't know how they, our farm, we had farmland adjoining each other, and some of his cows had actually gotten in our pasture in 1963. They came to round them up to get them, but there was one they could not round up. He left them there, and then on the morning of March the 14th, 1965, we met him when we were on our way to church. And uh, my father told him, you know, if you come tomorrow, I, he would get some others to come and help, because they, they, they knew this was a problem cow. And, uh, but the next morning when everyone gathered at the pasture, this man started claiming five or six of our best cows, and my father argued with him, and according to the others, my father said, we don't have to keep arguing, we just go to court. And he was actually going to his truck. The man is still talking, he turned around to say something, and that's when he was shot. Mm -hmm. So, struggles of a land mm -hmm. um, are throughout your story. What have you learned over this whole time about the relationship between, well, let's start with race and economic justice, race and economics. Yes. It's really, really tough when anytime you see, what, just looking at my father's situation, when you look at the fact that the family was working together for a better life for their, their children and children to come, um, he wasn't asking anyone to give him anything. He was willing to work for what he had, but there are others who don't want right. you to advance in that way. And, and I'm assuming this man shot my father simply because he spoke up to him, because that you just didn't do that during those days. Um, race seems to come into just about everything we do. I mean, look at how it impacted me right. many years later in 2009. You know, here you've gone out and you've tried to do all you can to help a farmer who happened to be white, and then someone comes up to say, you discriminated against the farmer. And I mean, I kept asking, who is this, why? You know, because I knew what I had done, but the other thing I wasn't sure of 
I had helped many white farmers, but based on our history in the South, I didn't think any of them would step forward to say what I had done for them. So I was totally happy and totally surprised when the white farmer I helped called to CNN to mm -hmm. say, hey, she saved my farm, you know. You never did get an apology out of Andrew Breitbart, but you did get mm -hmm. a settlement. He targeted you, though, coming back into this current period. He targeted you for a reason, because of your symbolic value in the South and, and to the movement. And, and I want to talk a little bit about what created that status for mm -hmm. you, um, what made you such an important figure in the civil rights movement. Let's start with this question of, of land again. Mm -hmm. uh, we just recently did a special on, on an upstate farm in New York called Soul Fire Farm that's mm -hmm. started led by a woman of color. And, and she talked about the growth of women of color farmers today mm -hmm. the num in numbers, but coming after a very long decline. Yes. Um, what's the story? What, what's happened, particularly with women of color and, and agriculture in America? Well, you, during the my grandmother's years and, and even my mother's years, uh, women were mu much more involved in, in the farming operations because those extra hands were needed. But then mechanization came and all of a sudden it didn't take a full, a big family, nor, a full, you know, or nor, nor everyone in the family to actually operate the farm. It became the man's uh, responsibility and that's when I say the family was left out of the farm because, you know, my grandmother's years, my grandparents had 14 children. They had, and they were landowners and knew where their advancement would come from, from everybody working, every, that land educated mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of us. And then if you look at the 60s, there's yourself, there is Fannie Lou Hamer, mm -hmm. there's Ella Baker and North, but people mm -hmm. organizing around land and, and food co-ops, disproportionately women, actually. You're right, because, I mean, when you look at the family, um, when you look at the communities, who's doing most of that work? It's women. But we've actually tried to do it in the background. That's what, that's what, when you look at the church, it's the women doing most of that work. But see, when you grow up in the South, you, you, you're being told that you need to stand behind mm -hmm. your man or stand behind men and they let men take They have ways of telling you that in the North also, just so <laughs> yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, your role is to support when the reality is you're doing most of the work. Yeah. And, and not to say anything, you know, men have their, their, their roles and their place, but we've done a lot of the work that we didn't get credit for. Well, one of the things that's so interesting is to think about what these stories tell us about what work is, what power is, what mm -hmm. leadership looks like. Mm -hmm. I mean, the leaders that you've come up with don't look like your, the leaders that we see in our, our textbooks. Um, for lots of reasons, mm -hmm. um, but they do give a different picture of what leadership might be. Mm -hmm. You took real leadership in the 60s, you and your husband, Charles Sherrod, and, and the people you were working with in the civil rights movement, um, when you decided to create this land trust community called New Communities, Inc. Yes. Um, I mentioned that you went through a process of imagining a new community. Can you take yourself back there? Because most of us haven't had that chance. Yeah. Can you take ourselves, yourself back there? What was different about it? I can tell you it was so empowering because the, the reason why we came up with this idea is that we could have a mass meeting and we were having them all over the area. Um, invariably a family would come because their child either tried to integrate a school or they tried to register to vote and they're living on land owned by a white farmer and once he found out he said they had to move so they would come to the meeting and now you have a whole family that's being displaced and a, a man that needs a job we started having meetings and decided to create this um, a community that we wanted to call new communities we got our hand uh, we were able to get an option I should say on some land and then we started bringing people together to actually talk about this community we had we talked about education and the kind of educational system we wanted we talked about health and the kind of health system we wanted so there were experts who came in 
because we had to hire someone to help with the planning and so forth. But I can tell you now that we put plastic around an old shed, uh, an equipment shed, and sawdust on the floor. And I still have pictures of some of those sessions where people were real, could really plan um, their community. And I, you know, for me, being a young person, I just didn't think anyone would fight you when you were trying to help yourself. Yeah. We were not asking for anything but the fight started almost immediately. You got a loan from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to do some of this planning. Yeah, it was, we actually got a grant from OEO, the oh. Office of Economic Opportunity, to do the planning. We had a one-year grant, and then we had been assured by OEO that we would get um, a major grant to help us begin implementing the plans, but because of the local opposition, uh, they fought us, their, their congressman entered into, I guess it was our congressman too, uh, entered into the congressional record that we were communist. Um, they would shoot at some of our buildings with us in them. Uh, so many things they were doing on the local and state level, um, and they were doing them all to try to keep us from being successful. And in the end? Yes, yeah, so much so at the end of the year, when we should have gotten the major money, OEO felt it was too political and told us we had to go through the normal process, which was getting local permission, state permission, and then getting the actual money. Uh, locals, of course, said no, and they had a big TV production to say no to us. Uh, and uh, uh, Lester Maddox was the governor of the state of Georgia. He, ve he vetoed all federal money coming into the state to our project. Yeah. The story continues. We, we don't have a lot of time, um, but you end up joining the lawsuit um, of the black farmers, Pigford versus Glickman, and securing a settlement in the end, finding yeah. out just how you were discriminated against and getting millions of dollars in constant restitution uh, from the USDA. You've now got a new, new communities. Um, in the couple of minutes or so we have left, can you tell us a little bit what you're planning there and how you're yes. gonna do health education and <laughs> everything else differently? Yes, um, of course we can't build the community we had envisioned. We had 6,000 acres then. We have um, 1,638 acres now, but it's a prime piece of property. Um, we did win and see. People think it was my money. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't win a settlement from USDA, but the organization did. I was just helping with the effort to, to make it happen. Um, so when you fast forward to yeah. 2009, we started looking for more land. We didn't let the, we just had this dream I mean, we could have, when we lost 6,000 acres in 1985, everyone thought it was over. We didn't know that the lawsuit, the Pickford case would happen, the black farmers lawsuit. And in fact, when, it, when the settlement, when, we, when the decision was made to settle with USDA, black farmers settle with USDA, uh, I was so busy trying to help farmers in other areas that I almost forgot about our loss. Right. And it was while well, three months into the process, I'm riding from Alabama where I've been helping farmers during the day that the light bulb went off. My goodness, new communities, new communities was farming in 1981. Mm -hmm. We can file a lawsuit. So we started looking for land and um, found a prime piece of property right there in Albany, Georgia. Ironically, a plantation. It, that's right, Cypress Pond Plantation was what it was called. It, we didn't know the history initially and actually didn't discover the history until after it had been purchased. It's quite some history. Yes, it was once owned by the largest slave owner and the wealthiest man in the state of Georgia, General Hartwell Hill Tarver. He was the head of the Georgia militia. He held the largest number of slaves at this plantation. and. Um, he built a, this is a huge antebellum home or house on the property. It's about 13,000 square feet. He actually built that in 1851. Um, it has a very, yeah. very interesting history. So what's your take on the Black Lives Matter movement? 
You know, I think it's a, it's a, a great thing to be happening now. I know that where I am, there's a lot of resistance and all I was listening to someone just a few days ago, all lives matter. But the fact is the acceptance of black people and knowing that we matter as well, because we've had so many murders. My father is one of them. He mattered to us, you know, and to have others understand that, I think, is, is a good thing. And to have people begin to acknowledge that. I know there's resistance to it, but to have people understand that we, we matter, you know. We have a lot to contribute here to and have contributed from slavery forward. What do you think economic development would look like if we really acted as if black lives matter and women's lives matter? Um, it would make such a difference in some of our communities because with every statistic that's bad, we are higher than anyone else. You know, it would make it would change with education. It would change with the prison population. It would change. It would help families to develop. Um, when you go back to that old welfare system where the man did, couldn't live if the family couldn't live in a home if the family was on welfare. Look at what that's brought us to this day. But just think if we could have had the same opportunities that that others had, it could have made a difference in our family structure now it's hard for us to get back to where we need to be and when we can't when we don't have jobs uh, when families are suffering it won't ever happen so to to be treated fairly that would be economic development for you yes yes thank you so much Shirley Sherrod really appreciate all your work thank you you can find out more about new communities Inc at our website The entire story of the New Communities Land Trust and the fight of the Sherrods is being told in a new documentary, The Ark of Justice. We'll keep you up to date when that film is released. The U.S. leads the way among wealthy democracies in poverty and making money out of it. On top of that, we seem to lead the world in persuading poor people that they're the ones to blame. At that, we are truly the best. Just take a look at debt. About three quarters of American households have at least one form of debt today, and most of us have way more than that. In addition to house mortgages, we're talking credit cards, car loans, even loans on our paychecks. And lenders are making money hand over fist. The Center for Responsible Lending, a North Carolina nonprofit that tracks predatory lending practices, reports that payday loans carry annual interest rates as high as four hundred percent. You want class war? Abusive loans are the great class warriors. They transfer wealth from the bottom to the top and drain assets out of families and communities, assets that could have been spent on lifting people up. They're also, if you like, the greenhouse gases of our social fabric, ever widening the wealth gap between families of different races. Families with annual incomes below 35000 are much more likely to receive an exploitative loan, reports the center. And borrowers of color are two to three times more likely to receive an abusive loan compared with a white counterpart. None of this is news to people like this week's guest, Shirley Sherrod, who grew up in southwest Georgia under American apartheid. Black farmers there never could borrow on fair terms. That's why so many were forced into abusive loans and lost their land. And that's why others, like the Sherrods in her community, started co-ops and land trusts to pool and preserve their resources. When the Sherrods' new community's land trust was finally forced into one of those abusive loans, they lost their land too. But they got more back later when they won $12 million in restitution after a decades-long lawsuit in which they proved discrimination of the most blatant sort. Before the case, we were made to feel bad as failures, says Sherrod. We were made to feel that we failed and that it was all our fault. But then there was all that documentation and restitution. Now Georgia has a new community land trust bought with the USDA's money feeding and training the next generation of young black, especially female leaders. It's just one example of what restitution can do. Now, how about more of it? To tell me what you think, write to me, laura at lauraflanders.com, and thanks. Mm -hmm.